turns on a little bit. So there's this piano music. Um, so no one's really ever heard of it. I guess I guess so, right? So my grandmother used to play this uh, piano music for me. That's not her. She has much older hands. Uh, and uh, she used to play this piano music, and no one had ever heard of it. And when she died, I kept the sheet music. And I tried to see if I could find a copy or something, and I couldn't. So I actually put in, I scanned in the sheet music, and I put a copy on Wikipedia. And six months later, people started actually um, posting copies of the sheet music, different versions, on eBay. And so I think what actually happens is people search on eBay and say, does this, uh, on Google, excuse me, or DuckDuckGo or whatever, uh, people search on, on the internet and see if they find the music, and if so, then they put it up for sale. So after six months, all these people started putting this music on the internet, and I started buying up all these copies. So I'm now actually the world's largest collector of this weird piece of piano music. So in case, uh, in case you want a copy, just ping me. Um, yeah, who's, who's the minutes person in the back? You? I also brought big stuff like that just to wake you up. Is everyone awake? All right, I guess I'll start. People are like, what? Didn't expect this. Um, just whoever's doing the video feed, um, most of the stuff can happen on the, on the screen in a terminal. So you probably don't want to see me. You probably want to see the, the screen. And uh, I might sit down a bit, so just to type. So actually, this desk is pretty cool. I think there's an up and down button for the desk somewhere. Yeah. Oh, so cool. It's like a spaceship. Uh, whenever you're ready, I'm happy to start. Cool. <clears throat> so apologies, everyone. I have a bit of a cough, but I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is James. I go by Purple Idea on the internet. I work for Red Hat. Uh, we'll talk about that shortly, because this is DevConf. Um, and uh, I just want to really thank the organizers for having me. I'm like my first DevConf, and uh, really want to reach out to the Debian community. And so thanks for, for having me here. Who am I? Uh, I'm a hacker. I'm a config management architect. At Red Hat, I have no idea what that means, but I hack on, hack on shit. I'm an engineering, not a marketing guy, so I'm not trying to sell you anything. There is no product today. Um, and I write a technical blog. Uh, who's read my technical blog or seen it before? Just raise your hand. If you haven't, just raise your hand anyway, so I'll know you <laughs> look really popular. Um, I'm actually a physiologist by training, and I don't know what it is what, with all these like, non-computer people hacking on computers, but uh, it's true. So if you want to talk about cardiology or venous return or advanced stuff, please let me know. And I'm a big fan of DevOps. So um, if you've seen my blog or seen some of my past work, um, you might be familiar with some of my puppet hacks. Yeah, you can keep the audio up. I have like random sounds. Uh, this is Beaker screaming because everything is on fire. So um, I started hacking on Puppet kind of a while ago. I think I got pretty good at it, and I wanted to build some pretty advanced things. So I started uh, writing some really outrageous code, and I started showing this off, I think, around 2013. Uh, did you know you can actually do recursion in Puppet? Raise your hand if you knew this. Uh, you don't want to do this. This is not good. The code's at the bottom if you really find out why. This was just a, like, can I do recursion in Puppet? Turns out you can. Um, sometimes you actually want, and I know this sounds wrong, but in fact you actually mathematically need to run Puppet again, and you preferably want to do it sooner. So you can actually do this crazy thing, which I invented. The code's again at the bottom where you decide when you want, if you want Puppet to run again, and you actually exec a Python program which double forks and watches the parent uh, Puppet process till it ends, then waits a number of minutes and runs again, right? Is this, is this nice? No, this is pretty nasty. You can build timers to do similar sorts of things. So you might want to say, start up a DRBD cluster syncing, wait an hour, and then change the resync rate for something for production. So you can do weird stuff like this, kind of nasty. And you can actually even build finite state machines in Puppet. I swear I actually did this. Please check the code. Um, but I, I really don't recommend this. So the real question is, is this the right way to build sort of advanced, complicated things? Come on, wake up, or I'll throw a fire at you. Yeah, OK, so this guy has the answer. Can you see the screen OK? Yeah. He has the nope, and he's just like, nope. This is my nope guy. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, all is noped. All right. So um, eventually, I had to, to think about this, and I thought about all the designs and things. And I sat down, and I said, I just need to write something new. And unfortunately, I'm really bad at naming, but I'm calling it uh, MGMT. Um, it turns out there's some weird band called MGMT, uh, which I'm not really into. I'm more of a hip hop guy. But uh, if you search for MGMT config, it's, it's much more findable. Um, just a really quick thing that I wanted to just say, because I heard like the occasional, most people have been excellent here, and actually in the, 
everything's great. But I want to talk about this Red Hat versus Debian thing really briefly. So um, there's really no Red Hat versus Debian versus Canonical thing. This is mostly internet garbage from like trolls and people that are trying to divide free software. And the real thing that I want you all to remember is it's really Red Hat and Debian and everyone else writing free software against proprietary software. Um, and at least that's the way I see it. Um, we're like 9,000 employees, so I'm sure there's different views. Um, I'm personally a huge fan of the Debian project. I tried to find out when I first started using Debian, but it was a really long time ago. I don't remember. Um, I don't always run Debian. I mean, my laptop's running Fedora. <coughs> But uh, nonetheless, it's very important. Um, and my project, I've specifically designed it uh, to be feature complete and have feature parity on both Fedora uh, and Debian from day one. So there's no like, here's the initial Fedora stuff, and if you want it to work on Debian, send the patches. Everything that goes in works on both, minus maybe the, the odd bug or something. But if so, you know, let me know. Um, and, and free software is actually, um, it's an important thing for us at this conference. And I really believe um, that config management is critical for that because config management is what makes uh, the software usable, especially on servers and also desktops, and also secure. So if you don't have the energy to manage your servers properly, you can have just bugs and people poning your stuff just because of laziness. So if you have good automation tools, I think this helps mitigate this. Make sense? Yeah? Oh, you guys are so sleeping. Who's shy? Just raise your hand if you're really shy, and I won't pick on you. All right, good. Excellent. So um, I'm going to actually get pretty technical, but I'm just going to give you a little intro of the tool. So um, if you're not familiar with config management, uh, last one, who's, who's familiar with existing sort of config management? And who's not? Who's not? OK, so it's pretty almost zero. The video guy is, I think, maybe playing. But uh, yeah, so um, basically in config management, typically you have some sort of graph, so a resource graph that expresses some dependencies between the resources. Um, and um, they run and so on. Uh, my tool is a bit different, and I'm going to show you the, the main three differences. So the first thing is that it runs the whole resource graph in parallel. This is different from normal tools. Um, the second thing is event-driven. I'm going to tell you what that means shortly. And the third one is it runs as a distributed topology. So distributed systems and Paxos and Raft and these sort of things are actually quite possible and quite advantageous today. So we're going to show you how that works uh, in a moment. So just the first thing. So this is basically how a resource graph it in Puppet or MGMT would look. And if you look here, can you see this OK on the screen with the red arrows? So the blue blobs each represent a resource, say a package to be installed, a service to start or stop, a file to set up, and so on. And the, the black arrows are the resources. Yes? Come on, be with me so I know. If you're lost, let me know. There'll be a bit of time at questions, but don't be shy if you're really, really lost. Um, and, and actually, so what current tools actually do is they look at this graph, and they do something called a topological sort, which is basically this red arrow. It just says, OK, I'm going to do one, two, three, four, then five, kind of arbitrary, six, and then seven. But in fact, we could actually do this. So if you look at this whole, the left side of the graph and the right side of the graph can actually run in parallel together because there's no dependencies, right? Great. A lot of, all yeah, right, getting better, warming up. It's a little chilly in South Africa, but we're, we're getting there. But in fact, also this left side here, if you look, once 1A is finished, you can run these two both in parallel, and then this one will wait for them both to finish and then run, cool? So this is sort of possible. Do you want to see a demo? Yes. All right, let's see a demo. OK, so uh, find the demo. OK, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you uh, this example. So this is just, say, a package that takes 10 seconds to install. This is just simulated. Uh, something, some service thing that takes 10 seconds to start up or do something, and some other command that takes 10 seconds. And this guy over here takes 15 seconds to run. So if we run this, how long should it take if it's running in parallel? 30 seconds, exactly. If it wasn't running in parallel, it would take, take longer. So we'll go here. Um, is that big enough for you to see? OK. So we're going to actually just, we're going to time this. So I've just compiled a fresh version from Git. Um, oops, bloop, bloop. turn that down. So uh, this is basically the thing. It's going to run, it's going to start up some back end stuff that works, and it's all contained. Um, and just to time this, we're actually going to run this converged timeout option equals five. So what's going to happen, it's going to run. And once this, the graph is in a converged state, that means everything's done, um, it will time up to five seconds. And after five seconds of being converged, it will quit. So the whole run should take about, exactly. So let's run this. Boom. So it starts up some stuff. And then right here at the bottom, you can see, here's that, that first one running. Okay, It's running this check apply. And that 15 second one is over here. So 10 seconds go by, boom. It finishes right here, 
and the second thing starts running. Five seconds later, that second parallel one on the right is running, if you can see at the bottom. Uh, five more seconds later, the second thing ends, and that last one, that third bump, uh, thing at the bottom uh, of the graph starts up. Eight, nine, ten seconds are up, that finishes. One, two, three, four, five. Nothing's happened, the whole thing ends. And you can see the whole tool run in about 36 seconds. So there's really, really very little overhead to the software. Um, I've added a whole bunch of new features. So it used to run in like 35.0 something, but now there's, there's more shit going on. So uh, really very low overhead. Did anyone completely miss what just happened? Don't be shy. Let me know. Do you like this? Is this a good idea? Why didn't we do this before? I don't know. I thought this was, and, and if you really didn't want to run something in parallel, there's nothing that says you can't have a lock that says only run up to so many operations at a certain time. But yeah, so that's the basic thing. Uh, you can do some complex graphs like this. Um, if you want to see a demo of this or other ones at the bottom, we can show at the end. But I want to move on, okay? So the second, second aspect is, um, is the event-based nature. So what we actually do, um, we have a nice picture. If you think about how uh, normal systems run, they start up, like say Puppet, or starts up, it runs through the whole graph, checks, applies everything, and ends, and 30 minutes later, it starts again, right? goes through the whole thing, 30 minutes later, again. So you're wasting resources over and over. And what happens if something changes on your system or you want to make a change in between that 30 minutes when it's sleeping? What's going to happen? Nothing. You're not going to know until you re-hit and it runs as, oh, now I'm paying attention again. So in MGMT, we actually do something different. We actually start up, we run, we go through everything, but we actually take a watch on each resource that we're doing. So for example, for files, I think I have some examples here. Uh, for files, we actually uh, take an iNotify watch. For services, we look at system, the events, and so on. So we actually watch that resource, and the second it changes, boom, we fix that resource. And because we run in parallel, we can only, we only need to fix the parts of the graph that need to be fixing. Um, and uh, for packages, for example, we use package kit events. And that's actually one of the ways and one of the reasons we use package kit, because it gives us events on if someone changes the package state, watching the RPM DB and Debian file databases, and, um, and also it's, it's fully compatible with Debian and Fedora and so on. So uh, you want to see a demo? Yeah. All right, let's see a demo. This demo is cool. Um, all right, so, so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to show you a little example. Um, so right now the DSL for this language doesn't exist, so I just have a raw graph just to show you. So I have three files, slash temp, mgmt, f1, f2, f3, that I want to create, and each one has contents, I'm f1, I'm f2, I'm f3. Make sense? Um, I also have one more file here, imf4, and it has this state absent. So f4 should not be present, but the other three should and have a certain defined contents, all right? So we're just going to run the tool. Uh, oops. Uh, oops. Um, OK, so I'm going to run this here on the left. But just so you can see what's happening, I'm going to go here and make this directory just so you can see. There's nothing in it. These are where the files are going to appear. So I'm going to run this on the left, and boom. So we go here, and before I can do anything ls, there's three files here. Cool? Make sense? We can actually cat them and see that, in fact, the contents are real. But we can actually even just remove f2 and ls, and boom, it's already back. Right? So you can actually remove f2, and it's back. But that, that's kind of annoying. So we can actually remove uh, f2 and cat f2, and boom. I mean, this is. Have you ever seen a command work this way? So on the right, we're going to just mess with the system. And on the left, I don't know if you noticed, but the system is actually noticing and responding. But this is kind of manual. And I know you all love automation and scripting. So I can actually watch dash n 0.1. And this is just a command that's going to run something over and over again as fast as possible. And as fast as I run it on the right, it's always noticing and, oops, killed my mic, and fixing it on the left. There is a question. Yes? Microphone. The question was, isn't that super scary? Well, um, yeah. You like to change your question. That's fair. Um, if you get it wrong, yes. you can't undo it. Because there's something listening and just Absolutely. So this is, you, um, this is a feature which I think is beneficial for a lot of reasons. This is just one. And some more advanced resources will make use of this too. But if you don't like this instant sort of thing, you can run this in puppet mode if you want. You can have it run, start up, converge, and 30 minutes later, run in cron again. I'm not criticizing that way. I'm just saying yeah. I'm not putting a small delay in there for like dry run or test before 
So you have disconnected that story. Obviously, yeah. Those are things that you can add, of course. But this is just showing you the, the best sort of fast mode. Um, and, and this is actually going to be quite important for, for later in the talk. So yeah, another quick question. Hmm. Everyone just suddenly said, whoa, this is possible, and got it, all scared. It, it, it seems to me like if you get it wrong, then it's just you have to fix it a different way. Instead of fixing it uh, by removing the file, you fix it by changing the YAML file. Uh, didn't quite understand. Instead of, so he's, he's saying it's worrying that if you get it wrong, you can't just remove it and get rid of it quickly. Yeah. But you, ca you can still change the input to yes, your yes, yes. system. Yes, 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 obviously. So actually, in fact, when you update your config, the tool actually can notice automatically that you have new config and fix it right away. So it's, it's, it's very event-based. It's very dynamic. Um, it turns out this is actually very useful for building uh, elaborate systems, and I'll, I'm going to get into that a bit later. Um, again, if you don't want this, then you're left with the status quo of config management, which was kind of bleak to me, which is wait 30 minutes, and then you'll, you'll have the same situation. Yeah. Um, so the, the key thing in config management, which was, is going to make config management useful and uh, a current tool that we depend on, is it has to be very, very safe. So if you are writing your config management code um, in some sort of language that lets you have off by one errors and things like that, then you're completely going to blow away your stuff and erase it. So this tool, uh, again, you're jumping far, far ahead into the presentation, but the idea is that we have very, very safe things so that at compile time, if something's going to go wrong, you're going to know then. Okay. So if you want, we can talk more. I've got to move on. Uh, I'll show you. I mean, you can just last little, little note here. You can also do things like, hey, Debian, this is cool, uh, and F2, and cat F2, that sort of thing, and it still works, right? So if you really want to mess with your sysadmins, oh, this mic keeps falling off. Um, there's lots of stuff you can do. And, and lastly, just if you touch uh, F4 and file F4, same sort of thing, right? It'll remove that file it will, that you added. Uh, before you had a chance. Cool? Um, quick questions. Anyone else? Good? You're itching for a question. Go for it. The principle of least surprise yes. would have me uh, make the file immutable in my file system rather than uh, relying on e being rewritten. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to set in the file permissions that it has no write access, you could do that. But that's uh, a choice that you have to make if you're configuring that file. Your software might want it to be writable or something. So if you wanted to say, root has no access to write this file, or something like that you could. But um, again, that's, this is a config management tool. We don't force our users to say, you must make your files not writable. Um, all right, so um, just a quick question. So this, I, I, I'm coming here to tell you that this is what I see as next generation config management. But does this feel like a different technology to anyone? Don't just scream it out. Anyone? Some sort of system D comment. No. Um, I actually see this, if you think about it, and not in the whole scope, but I actually see this as monitoring. So assume that you had actually pretty advanced resources. And again, this doesn't encompass all of monitoring. But if you had um, pretty advanced resources, you could actually think that um, all of the state of a particular thing that you're managing is actually built in that same resource. So we never have to have this wall between doing the config management, and then getting it monitored, and then putting it into production. We could put it all in one sort of holistic sense. So just something to think about. Um, next part is that third distributed topology, the thing that I was talking about. So this is, um, this is just a simple client-server topology. You have a bunch of clients in one server. And um, what, what software uses this, for example, in config management space? Louder? You, you got it. You're right, but louder. Don't be shy. So she said Puppet, right? So you have Puppet, Chef, these sorts of things. They have a server, a bunch of clients. What's the problem with this topology? Server's gone, everything's gone. Server's gone, everything's gone. Uh, bad. What's another problem? Okay. Doesn't scale very well. Let's look at a different topology. Uh, this one looks quite similar, but the arrows are pointing the other way. Uh, this is uh, what I call an orchestrator topology. So when you say orchestrator, I consider that to be a centralized orchestrator. Uh, what technologies use this? <laughs> oh boy, now you're, now you're getting into it. Uh, what? M Collective, uh, sure. Someone else said Ansible. But again, what's the problem with this, uh, this solution? Pardon me? I didn't hear you. Errands. Errands? Errands. Events. Uh, we don't have events, that's true. But uh, again, some other people had said it. It still doesn't scale. Same things as the first problem, right? It's still a single point of failure. 
Um, it's still a useful topology for certain things, but in general, there's still a lot of problems with it. So we thought about doing something like this, where every peer connects to every other peer. And what's, what's the obvious problem here? It doesn't scale, right? So if n, if n becomes a thousand machines, or, or heaven, I mean, even a small number of machines, it's just crazy. So, so in fact, what we do is something actually like this. So you have as many machines as, well, that you can afford, uh, I hope. And what we actually do is we, we temporarily elect certain ones to be sort of primary uh, machines in the cluster. And on top of this, we, oops, we, we um, build a distributed key value store. Now, we use etcd and the RAF protocol to do this. Um, and I'm going to show you how this works. So this will actually let um, everyone be able to talk through one of these masters. And if one of them goes away, we can reelect someone. So um, why do we want to do this? Now, we use this distributed key value store to allow um, all of the members of this cluster to pass information back and forth, but again, in an indirect way. So just to illustrate this, I'm going to show you um, a quick example. I'm going to make three hosts, A, B, and C. And each of these hosts is going to create one file. It's going to create one file on itself as part of its resource graph. And it's going to store another of those files, not on itself. It's not going to create that file. It's going to put it into this distributed key value store. This is sort of what Puppet would approximately have as an exported resource, except they don't work very well in Puppet. Um, and so each one has that file on itself, and it puts one up. But the other thing it's going to do is it's going to look in that graph, match a certain pattern, and pull everything that matches that pattern down. So um, this will sort of vaguely look like this. You know, you each have a file, you put it up, and you pull down everything. So how many files will everyone have on them after this runs? You have six? Not six. So, uh, so three. So you're going to get three from those other ones plus that initial one from yourself. So that's four total. Now let, let's actually go through this one at a time and actually see how this works. You want to see a demo? Yeah. All right, let's see a demo. Let me just kill this. I'm going to sit. I don't do a lot of hacking standing up. I know there's some people that are into like, oops. OK. Uh, ah. OK, so I'm just going to make, in this case, four directories. So I'm just making four directories, and I'm just watching these so you can see uh, what's actually happening live. These are each going to represent one host. OK? Now on the left here, I'm going to actually just start up uh, one of these engines. So we're going to time. We don't really need to time it, but um, because it's just going to run continuously. We run file. OK? Um, and we need the host name. So this is uh, you can use this host name flag just to simulate multiple machines on that same host. But so we run this up and very quickly, boom, uh, you have two files on the first machine. That's because you put one file on yourself and one file up into this database, and then right after you pull everything down that's in that database onto yourself. Therefore, two files. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Good. So the second one we're going to do make it a little bit bigger. Similar thing. Now, um, just to, to show you how this is working, forget the IP addresses, which are just a, a fact that we have to specify them when we're on the same machine. But all we do is we actually just point the second machine at any machine in the cluster. So in this case, we point, we're pointing it to the first machine. And that's how they cluster together automatically. So this one's going to put one file on itself and put one file up in this database and then pull down everything that's there. So how many files is it going to have? Exactly. It's going to have three. But because this is all event-based and awesome and magic, that first machine is going to notice that there's a new file in that database. And it's going to also pull it that down onto itself. So now the first machine and the second one are both going to have three files. Okay. So we'll run it, see how fast it happens. Boom. Right away, um, it's all done. Cool? Do you want to do a third machine? All right, let's do a third machine. I got all day. Um, or not all day, but till lunch. So again, same thing. We just point this at any, uh, any machine in the cluster. So now, same thing's going to happen. One on itself. Pull down everything. Push it up. How many files is it going to have? Four. Exactly. And the other two? Also four. You guys are pros. Can you help me write this software, please? You're all good at this. All right, so we're going to run this. Boom, four. And the other ones update very quickly right away. Cool? So just to show you, we're actually going to just run this. Oops. E ETC, we're just going to run this um, etcd command line tool to actually query the status of this cluster. 
And if you see, we actually can see that there's three members in the cluster, H1, H2, and H3. Okay, they're all the primary members, at CD calls it masters, in the cluster. Um, and, and, and they're all running this uh, cluster, and they've all done the work to exchange everything. So um, what we could do is we could start up um, a fourth machine. Now, I've told the cluster to have, ideally, um, three servers elected as primaries. So when we add a fourth one, okay, this would be our fourth one, okay, you'll see that quickly you have now five files on each one. Okay, and if we look at the cluster, you'll see that there's still those three machines that are the masters. But now, we can actually go and kill one. Okay, let's say it goes on fire because uh, you had one of those room heaters in your server room. So we kill this one, it shuts down, and then right away, this one here is going to notice, and we'll just run this command here again. You actually can see that it noticed that there was something wrong, and the cluster, using con safe consensus algorithms, decided F4, you're now going to be the new server in this cluster. So it took over automatically. Now, um, you don't just get forcefully uh, chosen to be a, a server in this cluster. If you don't want to be a server, you don't have to. Um, what actually happens is there's a, a negotiation protocol where you first volunteer, and you're available for volunteering, and so on. And if you want to bow out, you can, and so on. But this is basically how this elastic clustering works. Um, yes, we have a question. Go ahead. Oh, microphone. Hmm. What happens if one host says, delete this file, and the other host says, create this file? Right, so the, the key thing is that each host has its own little engine running on itself. So that machine only can say, make choices about itself. You cannot forcefully make another machine do something. What you can do, however, is you can expose a certain resource saying, I would like this file to be deleted. And then other hosts will look at data, and they have their own um, code that says what sort of things they would like to pull down. And then that um, machine which pulls it down and says, please do this, will then do that action that it consented to pulling down. Does that make sense? Um, if, I'll, I'll explain, I got one nod. Okay, so each machine only manages the stuff on themselves. So if I want to make this machine over here delete a file, I could say, here's a file pattern that makes that file gone. When he pulls it down, he's going to choose to pull down a certain pattern of things. And if when he pulls that down, he has a conflict between what he wants to do and the combination of what was found in that rules, then it's compile error. So these are things which wouldn't make sense, right? You can't say, create the file and delete the file. So all of those are compile errors, and it just won't work. Um, but it's a great question. Same thing in Puppet, actually. So um, it's, not, it's not actually too novel. It's just if you say Puppet ensure file created and ensure file deleted, it'll just be a compile error. Uh, yeah, any other quick questions? Yeah, go ahead. Can you actually reliably detect uh, that kind of conflict when you compile the rule set if it depends on data that is not there yet at compile time? Yep, uh, good question. So um, the truth is that the DSL is not uh, written yet. Um, but um, the short story is you cannot te detect anything, right? So in general, if you have weird data which um, in some forms causes problems, it will be a compile error. But that's usually indicative of a programming problem. And when this happens, it won't do anything to the machine. So it's a safe error condition, and then you can check your code and fix the problems. So it, there's no guarantee in any config management language that you'll always get what you want. But the, the, the closest thing you'll get to is when there's something that's wrong, nothing will break. It will just say, hey, there's a problem. Please investigate. So what you're saying is that basically the machine is compiling the rules. Correct. Uh, no, uh, it will. So the question was, uh, can you have file names depend on data? Yes, but the point is, it's it's um, it's impossible to guarantee that your code is always going to work depending on any data you throw in. That depends on if you write your code properly, and uh, we're we're building the language to make it very difficult to write something that leads to incorrect or incomprehensible code. I mean, this is this is just physics, and there's nothing new that we can do there to prevent that. If you know of something. I mean, let me know. Uh, yeah, another question. What's the transport layer like? Uh, for the, between the machines? Yeah. How yeah. do they communicate? 
Um, great question. This is actually using etcd. So actually, the etcd code is actually merged into this project, which is also using Golang. Um, etcd v3 is what we're using now. It just got released, um, and we've been using it in beta for a while. And that's actually using uh, HTTP2, which is gRPC. So um, it turns out it's quite efficient. Um, yeah. You need, you need a, an additional port open on all the machines, and you need an additional PKI. Yes. Uh, so the PKI stuff, I'm not going to talk about today because it's really out of scope for what I want to cover. Um, you definitely need a port open. Um, if you really don't want to have machines communicating to each other, um, there's actually a way we're going to do this with a push mode, uh, kind of similar to Ansible, where you just SSH in and so on. But yes, fundamentally, if you want to have a clustered system, you cannot have machines operating in bubbles. So you, you have to make that choice. Do you want to um, have things work across machines, or do you want to have just a bunch of separate, independently managed machines? It's just the, the main question is why didn't you, or have you looked at SSH, reusing SSH that oh, yeah. already exists? Um, SSH, uh, transporting all of this data through SSH is absolutely going to happen, and will happen probably through a centralized machine if you want to do it that way. So if you want to tunnel all of the SCD traffic through one machine, that will be something that's coming, but that's not uh, available on Git right now. Um, last questions, anyone? Yes. Did you do some scaling tests? Not at all. Um, I've done some private, very unscientific scaling tests. And I'll show you some performance stuff on other parts later. Um, but uh, for the etcd stuff, it's pretty well documented uh, in the etcd upstream. Uh, I think they're saying 1,000 or was it 10,000 hosts now. I mean, it's quite large. And if you really have clusters that are super large, then um, at some point, uh, if you hit a scaling problem, please let me know. But this isn't even production ready yet. So um, if you're interested in large scales and you have the hardware to run this on, ping me. Uh, yeah, another question. Yeah, I still have more say, stuff. Yeah, you say that you need etc d version 3, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. will you, if I use etc d for something else, will you like copy it? Copy, can, can you use an etc d more I already have in my infrastructure? I think I understand your question, but if I don't answer what you're expecting, please let me know. So you can do this two ways. You can use, if you want, an existing etcd cluster, or you can use the etcd cluster which we will build for you and manage for you. Um, so if you really, really are crazy about having your own etcd cluster, no problem. You just point everything to that existing etcd cluster, and things will work as normal. You won't get the auto-scaling of etcd members or anything like that, but you will have a working cluster. And um, as for um, if you're using an existing cluster, there's a, a namespace you can set so that MGMT won't set anything in with, that doesn't have that same prefix. Um, last questions? We can do questions more at the end, but there's a few more things I want to show you if you want to see them. It's up to you. Do you want to see more or are you fed up? More. You want to see more? 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 OK. Cool. Um, so yeah, this was just the example that I showed you. We kill one machine, and another one will take over right away. Um, so again, all this code is still a work in progress. So there are some little issues and things to improve. But if you want to help, please don't be shy. Um, here's another quick little feature. This doesn't demo as well, but I think you'll get the idea. And I, I will show you if you want. So it turns out that when we write manifest and, and code, um, we have to sometimes put these dependencies between things. So we want the package to get installed first. And then we want to set up the config file. And then we want to start the service. But it turns out we can actually figure out the dependencies for a lot of these things automatically. So if you have uh, package data, which you do, you know which services are going to be involved. So you can say, if this package uses that service, always make sure this is installed before you start it. Make sense? So we can actually do this. And I'll actually just show you a quick, quick demo. Let me just kill all this stuff quickly. Whoop. Oops. So let's kill that. OK. So. Close this, all these windows. So um, just really quickly, so I have, oops, <laughs> my fingers. Uh, um, I have examples, auto ed edges, three. So this is just a, a simple file. You have um, a DRBD package, uh, a config file, uh, the config file directory, and the service that are all in here. And we're just going to. Well, I don't need to time it. Uh, and, and by the way, all of the stuff I'm showing, this is all in Git master. So you can uh, check it out and do the same examples. Um, so this is auto edges 3. So 
we're just going to run this. My password is password, if you want to know. Um, so this is going to end, but just to show you, so when it actually builds the graph, the engine is actually quite clever, and it will add the dependencies that it knows make sense. So in this case, this package to service dependency and this package to file dependency, these edges, these, these dependencies are automatically added. Someone is asking a question which is usually, but I don't want this auto edges, so yes, you can disable it if you don't want. It's an optional feature. Yes, quick question because I'm almost out of time. Is it a bug that it didn't add an edge between the config file and starting the service? No, it's not. Um, it's not a bug because we cannot actually detect that. But in the future, um, systemd will probably be able to know that certain config files are related. So if there's a way you can detect it logically, tell me and we'll add the patch. Okay? Ask me later. You can check which package owns the uh, uh, config file. I understand your question, but um, I believe there's no way to detect this right now. If you know of a way, talk to me after, and we'll add it in the code. Or you can add it in the code. But uh, yeah, so anything that we can automatically detect, uh, we can add an edge for automatically. And there's an API to do this. So if I have missed something and you know of a way, please let me know. Um, I want to show you another thing. This is actually more interesting. So this is just some shitty graph of three files, uh, three packages. So we got PowerTop, uh, SL, and Kause, my favorite packages. Um, well, these two are. Uh, files and a service. And when you run Puppet or some existing tools and you run this graph, what's going to happen? Uh, I guess uh, versus the package installation. What's going to happen? Anyone know? Has anyone done this? If you watch your configs running, it turns out it's going to run uh, apt-get basically one, two, three different times. It's going to go through, start up, overhead, check cache, so on. Three separate times. Same thing with the um and so on. So this is hugely wasteful. So we actually can do this feature called automatic grouping. Um, and what it actually does is it analyzes the graph, looks at the dependencies, and in this case says, ah, I can redraw this graph to have these three bubbles overlapped on top of each other. And that way, you can complete all of that package installation, in this case, in a single step without having to wait over and over again. You want to see a demo? Yeah. Let's do a demo. Um, oops. Um, show you the, uh, so I'm just going to sit here. So on the, whoops. Where's my terminal? Someone got scared. Don't worry, I won't keep you from dinner. <laughs> he has to go to the bathroom. Um, all right. Yeah, I have to go too. Uh, okay, so we're going to remove we're going to remove PowerTop, SL, and Cow, say, password. All right, good. Oops. Remove. I'm just going to remove. Uh, did I? Did I do that wrong? Ah, good. Oh, I have a little little typo. Sudo, move, Cow, say, SL, PowerTop. Ah, okay, so these packages are not installed. Good. Is that what I typed wrong? Cow say. Okay, these are on, I don't think these are installed. Yeah, they're not installed, it's just unhappy. All right, good. So what we're going to do is I'm going to run this software, this great software which I wrote for you. Um, file, examples, package. Uh, oh, sorry, um, I have it in this group. Okay, so we're going to run this. Let's hope the internet works. It starts up, and boom, right away in the single transaction, it's installing these three packages. So internet is going, um, quite efficient, quite fast, uh, module internet. And a few seconds later, I think this should be done. Hey, CowSay works, great. But, um, and you can actually even, you want to see a cow say trick? You can say, cow say, cow say, hey, Debian, um, and do like crazy stuff. But <laughs> no more fun time. We're going to actually remove pkcon remove cow say. I'm sorry. But we run this, and on the right, we've removed it. On the left, if you notice, it's already saying nope, and it's reinstalling it. So cow say is back, right? So everything is good. and. Same thing, event-based, noticing that something's wrong, and putting it back. Um, just to like, um, you can actually do this, this auto-grouping for other resources. Package is just the most obvious example where there's obvious performance benefits. But there's a whole bunch of resources we haven't even written that, that will be able to use this API, um, and uh, so on. 
Uh, this is just to poke fun of other software. So shorter is better. Shorter means less time. Um, and if you look over on the right, the, the left to the right, it's basically installing one uh, package uh, versus three packages. And the more packages we install, the difference in these bars gets bigger. So that's these red bars are Puppet, and the really small bars are this tool, and the package manager is just running raw. And so, yeah, if you had five packages, this gets even bigger, and you waste more and more time if you happen to be doing packages. Um, there are similar benefits for other sorts of, of things. Um, bigger is worse. It's always good to remember that. Um, one last, there's a cool little thing. So on the first time I gave this talk, I actually pointed out that someone could write a compiler to take existing Puppet code and run it on this engine. Because like, if you have to rewrite all your Puppet code or Chef code or whatever, this would suck. And some uh, brave soul, who, I, who is now a, a good friend of mine, uh, said, this is awesome. I want to write this. Because you need to know Puppet internals. And I don't know Puppet internals. And so he actually wrote this. And this is beautiful. I mean, uh, you can try this out. Again, everything here is all free software. Um, so it's not finished. It's not perfect. But it's pretty close. And uh, you can actually run directly your existing Puppet code on this engine. So you get all the benefits of parallelism and so on. Again, not all resources, or not as many resources as we like, exist in MGMT yet. But it's a good start, and all the plumbing is there to add new resources. So if you want to get involved, try this out. Um, if you were to just take your existing Puppet code and just run this in production for the first time and expect it to work the exact same way, you're a little bit crazy, but it does exist. And uh, you should check this out. Um, I know there's some questions. I'm just going to finish up, and then you can ask questions. So just what's coming in the future? Um, so uh, again, there's no DSL right now. Um, I need some help working on this. I have some designs. So if you really are into languages and safe things and declarative functional reactive programming, maybe, please give me a shout. Um, that's work in progress. We need to write more resources. So we can write powerful resources. We can write a resource for a virtual machine and have a declaratively managed virtual machine on your system. Right? Think about that. We can have a timer resource. Actually, this is about to get merged. We can have a network resource that actually makes sense. And because these things are all distributed systems, you can change the network without breaking your puppet run. If anyone's ever done that, you know what I mean. Um, lots of things, a push node. And this is really a community tool. So this is about you. It's, a, it's not a product. This is just a project that I'm running. So how can you help? This is about you. You need to do work. Um, how can you help? You can use this, test it, patch it, share it, document it, star it, blog it, tweet it, discuss it, hack on it. Like, you guys are hackers. You know how to do the thing. Um, hack this, right? This is, this is code for you. This is one marketing slide, because Red Hat gave me some money to come here, which is really nice of them. Uh, so buy their shit if, you, if you'd like to. Um, and again, this is, an upstream, this is an upstream project. It's a community thing. It's not a, pro it's not a product. It's just a project. So um, please get involved. Uh, let's just recap. Answer. Now let me recap. Have you seen this guy? He recaps his pen at the end of his slide. Um. Um, yeah. Um, here are some friendly links uh, for you. There's the technical blog of James, which I know you all read and love. Uh, if you want to put me on Planet Debian, I would love that. Uh, there's uh, the project on GitHub. So I'm Purple Idea slash MGMT. You can find it. Uh, you can search through the blog. There's now four articles about this. And there's also links on the GitHub page at the bottom with uh, links to at least one other recorded talk um, and the puppet work and so on, all that stuff. And on the internet, on Twitter, on IRC, GitHub, Gmail, RedHat.com, and so on, I'm Purple Idea. So you can ping me on Twitter and be like, this is awesome. I, I love this. Um, just a fun little slide for people who like fire and magic. Um, so um, if you want to like harass the Debian committee, oh, he has to take his pills. His alarm went off. Um, uh, please email an review. If you like this talk, if you like the session, like email me or email the Debian people and let them know so that I can get feedback. And if you want to hang out in IRC, we're about like 50 people now in MGMT config. So please uh, do that. If you have questions, I'm happy to take questions. And thank you very much for listening. Questions? Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. I have one more. Um, how oh. would you depend on uh, machine state like puppet facts, essentially? So um, the question is, how would you depend on machine state like facts? So facts will come with the language. So the language isn't ready. So there's no concept of facts right now. And I don't want to get into the design. But I do think it makes sense. And if you really want to hack on this, ping me, and we'll talk about it. And uh, you can have a say in how it, how it gets built. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, gentleman over here in the center. How do you handle failure? Could you say that again, Alana? How do you handle failure? 
How do you handle failure? That's a really good question. Um, so uh, actually, to be completely honest, the like advanced error handling code has not been written yet. I plan to write that probably in the next week or so. Um, the way you actually will handle failure right now is it will just keep you trying. Um, excuse me. But uh, the better code, which I will write, is will be meta parameters to say allow up to this many failures, no more than this many per second, and stuff like that. So um, failures happen, and you'll be able to control what happens uh, when they do and how often you allow them before you have a permanent failure. So yeah, great question. Uh, any other questions? Yes, gentleman in the back. Um, can it update itself? Uh, can it update itself? Great question. Uh, there's only one version right now, which is Git master. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I mean, there's no, uh, this is like pre 1.0, so there's no real API stability or anything like that. Um, there isn't really much that uh, should be a major problem in updating itself. Like, you just have a new package and stuff goes on. What will be a problem is if the DSL were to change and so on. So, again, pre 1.0, I wouldn't really worry about this. Um, or if post there's a problem hmm? with the update process, so some of the daemons keep on working and some of the others stop yeah. working or they conflict in some way. So, so that's a good question. And so that actually comes down to, the question just to restate a different way is, um, what do you do if you have clusters running different versions of the software at the same time? And even um, being a little bit more specific, what do you do if you want to roll out a new configuration um, across your cluster and how do you handle that? Um, so that actually, that code also doesn't exist yet. Um, and uh, there will be uh, probably something called like an execution plan or so on. And I'm not sure what the best way will be in practice, but at least initially when we're hacking on this, there will be probably more than one way to do it. So one possibility will be that you push a new config into your cluster and it waits for a synchronization that everyone has converged and stopped running the current config before you switch over. Or it could be that for certain resources, you don't care and you just want them to run right away. So whether this is a metaparam or a sort of global state flag, it really is to be decided. But if you want to help on this, please uh, ping me or come in channel and we'll have a, a good talk about it. Uh, got quest time for one more question or two more questions? Um, don't be shy. Who's shy? Who are those shy people? We have a question from the <laughs> gentleman. One question here, quick. Yeah. Oh, you're shy. Okay. Question? Yeah. Grab. You're shy also. OK, so we have people advertising that they're so, shy, but they don't have questions. OK, then I. Then so I, I guess that's it. Oh, you have a question. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. I wasn't sure. Sorry. So you, many times you mentioned Puppet. Yes. But how about Ansible? It's, it's still evolving. It still has like a lot of capabilities. In fact, I think they now introduced this uh, declarative for, for virtual machines, this virtual install. Ah, so I'm actually, I don't know about the latest <laughs> developments in Ansible. Um, I do believe, I agree with you, it's a great tool and it's very powerful. And that's what you should use today if you are happy with that tool. Um, in fact, Red Hat bought Ansible, so like should definitely use it. But um, my tool is not something that's ready for production. This is a future technology to try and solve some very, very difficult problems, which um, might turn out to be um, needed, might, might turn out to need solutions. So um, would I run this in production in the next year? Probably not. But we're trying to build it and see, and we think it's kind of interesting. And maybe one day it will be uh, something that you'll want to want to migrate to or so on. But uh, for now, you know, use your stack that you're comfortable with. Puppet, Ansible, you know, Bash scripts for all I care. I mean, it's up to you. So yeah, I think there are time. I'll be around um, for I think three or four more days at the conference. I leave on the ninth. So if you have questions, if you want to get your patch merged, if you want to do a little hacking session to learn how to write write a brand new resource, just ping me. Don't be shy. And I have some. Uh, random stickers from my travels in a bag if you want to get some free stickers. Not MGMT stickers, unfortunately, but yeah. Thank you very much.